think that was uh, my cue. Good evening, honored guests, friends, colleagues. Mariana Garobio, welcome. President of the National Council of Switzerland. And all of you tuning in from afar and watching through the webcast. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I have looked so much forward to this. Um, and I will serve as your cheeky moderator, instigator, troublemaker. Uh, my name is Katja Iverson. I'm the president and CEO of a global <coughs> advocacy organization called Women Deliver. And as we say a little cheekily, women deliver and a lot more than babies. Um, and um, I also want you to uh, tweet your hearts out if you are so inclined. Uh, the hashtag is WEF, W-E-F-19, because we need to make sure that this discussion about violence against women and what we can do about it doesn't only stay in this room, but really goes around the globe and get more people interested in it. Because that is really what is needed today. So Women Deliver is a global advocacy organization. We uh, spend our lives on uh, changing hearts and minds and driving investments, political, financial and social, uh, in gender equality and uh, girls and women. And in their safety, in their rights, in their well-being, and in their social and economic participation. So we know that the, the World Economic Forum is annual meeting. It's a busy time, and there are many competing events. So I thank you for spending the time here tonight. You could be many other places, but it means a lot to us that you are here. So just a little bit about the flow of today. We'll start by hearing from the wonderful panelists, some of the experiences, some of the knowledge, some of the what we see happening in the field of violence against women. Then we will open the floor for a Q&A, for question and answer for about 20 minutes. And afterwards, we're in for a really, really special treat. We're gonna see the world premiere screening of the movie, My Body Is Not A Weapon. And we're so lucky that we have the man who uh, did the movie here tonight, and you'll meet him a little later. But let me just set the stage really quickly for what it is that we are about to discuss. Human rights violations caused by gender-based violence takes place in every single country in the world. It transcends ethnicity, religion, language. It's with rich, it's poor, it's north, it's south, it's east and west. And we know, and the data shows, that girls and women bear the greatest brunt of gender-based violence. Not that it, also, it doesn't happen to, to men and boys, it does, but the data shows that it's really girls and women. Globally, one in three women will experience sexual, physical or sexual abuse, violence in her lifetime. Roughly one in three girls have experienced forced intercourse or other forced sexual acts. And in the world where 54% of the population is connected to the internet, we see a growing and growing problem of uh, bullying, cyber violence. One in 10 European women have reported to have experienced that. So as we, as girls and women, go about living their life in public places, it's very imminent, it's very prominent, it's very physical. And it happens in the classrooms, in the boardrooms, in the bedrooms, in the streets, and at work. So, and it doesn't only harm the individual girl or woman, it has a ripple effect that affects families, affects communities, affects economies. Violence against women costs, not that this is, should be kind of an economic discussion, but it costs 3.7, in some countries 3.7, percent of, glo of a national GDP a year, and that's almost double the number that many countries spend on education. So that's a waste. But we're not only here to talk about the challenges and the problems, we're also here to talk about solution and what works. And we have some great people that can share experiences on that. 
because we do know that it can't be tackled and it is not a God-given thing. So I am so honored to kick off this discussion uh, on our duty as leaders, as fellow citizens, as advocates, human rights defenders, doctors, uh, to address gender norms and dismantle the systems that make the violence prevail. So we have a really, really good group here. Um, so let me just kind of dig into that and just present very quickly. So right here to my left, we have Dennis Mugwege, the founder of the Pansy Foundation from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if I may, warm congrats on the prize, the Nobel Prize winner. And Karan Yohar, head of Dharma Production, India, and a strong cultural leader. Pascal Barisbul, who is the State Secretary from Switzerland, for, for State Secretary for Foreign Affairs, but also has a long history and interest from being a researcher and a field worker and a judge in domestic violence cases. Rachel Haas, Managing Director of No More USA, welcome Rachel, and Amy Cuddy, who's a renowned psycholo psycho 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 psychologist, um, social psychologist, and author. So thanks a lot for being here, and let's jump right into it. Uh, we've agreed that we are on first names. So Dennis, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Pascal, we'll start with you. Before your, your current job um, as state secretary, you, you had, as I said, quite the career in, uh, in human rights, law and policy. So having seen all these different areas and from different angles, how can we best strengthen both nationally, both nationally and internationally uh, the laws and legislation so that the perpetrators of gender-based violence are held to account. Thank you very much and uh, let me just start um, saying how honored I am to be in such a distinguished on such a distinguished panel and, and um, how much um, I am um, happy to see so much interest in that topic which um, I consider as very relevant ever since I understood how widespread um, violence is in all of our societies. So we are talking about um, different forms of violence against women reaching from domestic violence more in our society here in Switzerland up to violence in conflict. Uh, so it's also very different legislations and responses we have to um, find. But there is two common points I think in all those, these uh, phenomena. One is that um, people, it's mostly men, but not only think that it's okay to be violent. That is one reason why it's so widespread. Um, and the other one is that often these cr crimes go unpunished. So accountability is the second aspect. Uh, lack of accountability is the second aspect, which is um, the reason why the, it is so widespread. So what did we do nationally, internationally, and also on a European level? Um, I think one thing, it's really gender equality. So in Switzerland, it was step by step by introducing women's rights to vote, which came in late in 71, then having in our constitution gender equality in 81, and then having all the legislations also in criminal law in the 90s. But I think which was most relevant was the, the shelter movement. Uh, the shelter movement really uh, was awareness raising here in Switzerland, but it was so successful that police thought, well, if there is an incidence of violence, we just bring it to the shelter. And, um, and then it's okay for us. And so what we did uh, in the 90s and in the, in the beginning of years of 2000 is to bring all stakeholders together, civil society, shelter, people, police, m doctors, uh, to have a common response to the phenomenon on, on, on domestic violence um, um, mainly. And so to formulate a common response so that the victim doesn't have to go to all the uh, different stakeholders and tell her story again and again and be victimized several times. So I think these tools are in place nationally and they have to be implemented. On the international level, I would say 
with the Beijing conference, that was a, a kickoff, and then it was civil society which came to the Security Council, and I think it's probably the, the, the only resolution in the Security Council which was pushed through by civil society in the year of 2000, the resolution 1325, Women, Peace and um, Security, to protect women, in to the make United them participate, Nations. and yeah. to introduce also yeah. all the tools we have. So we have tools on national, regional, and international level, the problem is not legislation, the problem is implementation. Yeah, so that's the part about holding the perpetrators to account, which I hope we can dig in a little bit more a little later. So, but let me uh, jump to you, Karan. You are a cultural leader, you are a director and producer in Hindi cinema, and you know what's moving and shaking in culture, but also how culture shapes societies. So. In many cultures, we see, as, as Pascal said, violence is accepted. It's custom. It's almost, yeah, I don't want it demanded, but of course not. But, but it's, it's, it's accepted. Uh, it's customary. Um, and, but how can we use, and how do you use, popular culture to really as a tool to transform negative gender norms and to... to um, to prevent violence against women? Uh, thank you. And I can uh, address this question as a filmmaker. And as a filmmaker, as you know, that we tell stories. And I can only address the situation emotionally. That's the only way I would know. Uh, it's not what we need to do. I think in Indian cinema, I speak for cinema in general, but also because I represent Indian cinema, I speak for Indian cinema. It's what we need to stop doing. I think what we need to stop doing is we need to stop objectifying women on screen. And I've been a victim of, I'm not a victim, sorry, I've been a culprit of that myself, where we've had song situations where there is a certain objectification of women on celluloid. And that does result in, in those ramifications which result in abuse on different levels. Many of us filmmakers back home hadn't realized that till the last two decades where we saw the kind of data move in the wrong direction. And so I think we have to stop doing a certain way, empower women on screen tell stories that are positive, that can change mindsets, because cinema is such an impressionable medium. We reach out to millions of people across the world. How we project our women on screen can change the fabric of the way men think. That's my response as a filmmaker. But just when I discuss this organically, some things that we really need to address vis-a-vis -vis this topic is, we need to address it, and I'm sure you would be able to tell us more about that. But I think what we need to do is it all begins at home and it begins at a grassroots level, level from the parenting process. It's what you say to your boys at home when they're growing up or to your girls as well. We say lots of things very loosely at home. Sometimes we have to stop saying those things. It's like telling a boy stop crying like a girl. Things like that can really impact the way that boy grows up and how he thinks of women. You know, he cannot be thinking of women in a weaker way because from the very beginning, it's how you train your children, how you parent them. We have to basically stop the entitlement of boys and men for this abuse to come to an end. And that can only happen initially by the parenting process. I believe that very strongly. And those are communications that some of us filmmakers are trying to kind of incorporate in our narrative. And hopefully that thought process is emulated, is absorbed, and it will cause a change. I believe that as a filmmaker, we can only do that, tell positive stories and change the way men think about women. And by that, all you have to do is make those women empowered on celluloid and stop objectifying them in different ways. And we tend to do that because sometimes we just think that you know it's fine to do so. We don't give it an additional thought. But we don't realize that there is an audience and a large section of an audience comprising of men that will actually walk out of that cinema hall and think it's okay. Iconic stars are doing certain things on screen and it's okay for them, it's okay for us. It's not okay. No means no on many levels and we have to kind of inculcate that in the DNA of our cinema and our society. So using culture positive role modeling on both the female and the male character uh, is a way to go and then I think, as you said, it, it starts at home. We know from research that, that girls feel equal and as strong and as smart until they are four or five, but when they become six and seven and Before eight. Before we cause change yeah. with the men, I think we need the parents to change. And yeah. I'm a parent, every parent, I just, I have twins that uh, were born two years ago, and I know that my responsibility is to say the right things at home, because mm -hmm. what we say really molds them and what makes them the human beings they're going to be. Yeah, so, so, so in the language, in the action, in the culture, yes. and everywhere. 
And we are really living in, in a unique time when we talk about violence against women. We, you know, we've all heard about the Me Too, uh, Time's Up, uh, Neona Menos, if we go, 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 to go to Latin America. And it really is about standing up and speaking up and continuing to do that. And uh, Rachel, that's uh, one of the things that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, your organization, No More, you work to keep up the volume, the noise, the awareness on domestic and sexual violence. Um, but, but that's, you know, for t way too long it's been, it's been hidden. It's been something women has not spoken about. It's not been spoken about in public, but no more. So um, how can we break that silence? How can we continue to break that silence, particularly also around young women? because the statistics are grim. Absolutely, and I just, I wanna <laughs> acknowledge that um, uh, violence also affects men and boys too, and you, you spoke on that earlier, and I think um, if we don't uh, include men and boys in, in this conversation, I think we reinforce um, the stereotypes uh, that continue to perpetuate violence, um, and, and I think it is really important to know that w truly it is one in six uh, men have experienced sexual abuse before the age of 18. That's staggering, and we don't talk about it, you never hear about it, but we, and it, it's, it needs to be in the numbers as well, and so I think that's a really important part of the conversation. Um, and the more we talk about it, and this goes back to your question about breaking the silence, the more women share their stories, the more that um, we create space for the stories, the, the, the more acceptable it becomes. And I think um, raising awareness is hugely important, um, but also creating the space for people to tell their own stories is, is amazing. And, and technology has allowed us to do that um, in a way that we've never been able to before. Um, but we also, we have to continue to push the narrative forward. Is that what you do in No More? You kind of open that. Yeah, we're um, so no more is a public awareness campaign. We're also a coalition of thirteen hundred organizations, grassroots organizations that are creating change in local communities. So it's an open source platform, and through the public awareness campaigns, we're using media to transform the social norms that enable violence. But we're also providing a platform that anyone, any individual, organization, business can use that supports ending domestic violence and sexual assault, tailor it to their community. We've seen UK says no more, South Africa says no more, Australia says no more, Ecuador dice no mas. So um, we're a grassroots movement and invite you to uh, learn more about it at nomore.org. Right. <laughs> Thank you. May I jump to you, Amy? Yes. Um, because it kind of ties into to the, to the discussion here, both in terms of, of culture, but also speaking up. So the power structures and stereotypes that, that, uh, that we spoke about, uh, about proper roles, not really proper, uh, for girls or for men and women, uh, perpetuates the occurrence of, uh, of violence. It almost often normalizes it. Um, but you know, what is the, psychology of that sexism uh, that we see in gender-based violence. Yeah, and uh, I think that's something that that is widely misunderstood. And I would say, just before I even start talking about that, that w if we are to make progress, we need to fix that. I talk a lot with my husband about misunderstandings that men have about uh, aggress you know, violence against women and, and, and how it hurts women over time in aggregate. Um, you know, sometimes people will say, well, that's, what's the big deal about this thing? And it is a big deal, it's, and it, it's meant to be a big deal. Uh, but I think we really don't understand stereotyping, uh, uh, or the, the public generally doesn't. Gen and, 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 and back to what you were saying about boys, I think it's so important that we understand that there are st gender stereotypes go both ways, right? So there are stereotypes of, bo of boys and men and, and girls and women. We have two kinds of stereotypes that we talk about. Um, prescriptive stereotypes, that's what, what a group should behave like. So women are supposed to be sweet and kind, and they're not supposed to be domineering and tough, right? That's the, the second is the proscriptive stereotype. 
for men, it's, it's flipped around. It's the opposite. So they are supposed to be strong and tough. That's the prescription. They are not supposed to be caring and soft. They're not supposed to cry. Um, and and you, you see how these two things together uh, create a, a huge problem and, and um, push a lot of boys and men into feeling that they should behave in a way that may not even really sit well with them, but, but, but they're told that they should. They get a lot of pressure to behave badly. I mean, you think about sort of hazing in fraternities in US universities. I mean, they're pushed to do things that are really um, awful and, and that go against maybe their own principles. But so I think understanding the stereotyping is really important. Um, now, when it comes to stereotypes of women, stereotypes, gender stereotypes are very different from other kinds of stereotypes because there are no two groups in the world whose survival is is so dependent on being interdependent, right? So men and women can't just stop talking to each other, right? So that means that stereotyping is complicated when it comes to sexism. Um, stereotypes of women tend to fall into two groups. Women are seen as either really warm and sweet and not competent, and they're to be sort of held on a pe pedestal and, and treated like fragile dolls, or they're seen as competent and really cold. Now, people who are high on the first, which we call hostile, uh, benevolent sexism, are also high on the second, which we call hostile sexism. So the same people who see some women this way categorize other women into this other category of competent and cold. Here's a, a finding that I think is really um, striking. When people think about sexual harassment in the workplace, their stereotype is that the women who are being sexually harassed the most often are the, the, the most powerless, the ones who are seen as sweet and maybe seen as sexy uh, and not seen as particularly competent. I mean, and again, that's a stereotype of them. That's not the case. The women who experience the most sexual harassment in the workplace in US and Canadian studies are the women who are seen as competent and threateningly, threateningly competent and not nice because men see them as a threat to their success in the power structure in the workplace. So sexual harassment is not, uh, it's not about flirtation. Uh, it is about pushing, it is literally about silencing and expelling this, these people from, from the, the workplace. It's, it, it is about removing them from having a voice and taking their power away. So I think that's an important thing for us to understand, that that, 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 that kind of violence is not, it's not innocent. Um, and it's, it's not about um, attraction. It is about power. Yeah. And if I may use the word power to pivot to you, Dennis, uh, because I think you see you know, your work in the, the, in the Congo uh, with, um, you know, you have worked there since 99. You have saved, what do you call it, more than 50,000 women who had been uh, survivors of sexual violence. Uh, you've helped care for that um, in the Pansy Hospital. And we know that, that that rape has been used as a weapon of war. And that is, if anything, about power uh, since the conflict began. And you work both as a physician, but also as a, as an, a strong, strong advocate. And uh, you've been awarded the Nobel Prize for that. Um, your, 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 your work was renowned across the globe way before that, so it was just an extra uh, crown. Um, so you are really an authority, but disaster and conflict really put girls and women in a, in a special uh, vulnerable situation and at, at strong risk uh, of rape and abuse and harmful practices. But how do we, how could we end sexual violence and rape as a weapon of war. And you, uh, Dennis, will be speaking in French. So if you want to take your, your earpieces on, then um, we will hear much more. And I think there will be people who will be handing out the earpieces, maybe, if there was not everybody picked it up. Oh, sorry. Don't be. I'm sorry. We want to hear your story, and that's <laughs> best expressed in the language of your comfort. I can hear.
All right, are we, um, are we earpieced up? Thank you. So Dennis, let me get back to you. And it was in, in disasters, in conflicts, uh, we see it. And so, so just a simple question yeah. in a couple of minutes. How can we end? Uh, merci pour la Thank you for your question. What happens? in a conflict situation where rape is used as a weapon of war, that is simply a stronger version of the type of violence we see in normal, in other societies. As our colleagues have already said, you can see in all societies that there is sexual violence used as a means for men of dominating, inflicting violence on women is to control them more fully. In some societies, there are laws and there are social rules. And there's a matter of faith as well, which uh, results in the, dis the urge to use this violence is stopped thanks to these rules. But in a disaster situation, a conflict situation, there's no, there are no laws, there's no faith, there are no social norms in place which operate, and that releases this violence, which was already there, was latent, and this violence then becomes much more visible in a conflict situation. So if you want to combat sexual violence in conflict, then you have to really do a thorough job. You have to start working with the society as a whole. And peaceful societies, if you don't work on societies which are at peace, then it's too late to do anything once a conflict arises to stop sexual violence. Often, in armed conflict, these are conflicts, the aim of which is to get hold of power, to control, to dominate. And today we are in a, in a difficult situation, an unfavorable situation, because the people who fight for power by using women's bodies as a battlefield, by using sexual violence as a weapon, a weapon of mass destruction, let's, let's use those terms because it is an effective weapon. It's uh, just as effective as conventional arms both in transverse and vertical terms, it is highly effective. And unfortunately, these, uh, this is a weapon which is accepted in our society. And uh, when victory ensues, well, then the people who have resorted to this form of a weapon are not uh, put at a ban from society. They're not being punished for the fact that they're destroying this uh, humanity, this mankind which we share with women, and they continue to be accepted in society, these people. Therefore, I think it's important that all activists fight to ensure that we agree that these weapons, this weapon, using rape as a weapon, is as uh, abhorrent as using chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. The effect is just as disastrous, not just for the victim, but for the whole environment and coming generations. So we have to do a lot more hard work to, uh, to show the, what, the, what rape as a weapon of war really is, to show it, it up for what it is. Follow-up question. Um, why is that not happening today? You know, why is it so accepted? Is it because it's women? I think that's a very interesting point, because when you meet the women in a conflict, whether it be in Iraq, in Syria, in Colombia, in the Democratic Republic of Congo or Sudan, when you meet these women, you can really feel that 
we're all lagging behind when it comes to taking action against this terrifying weapon. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is it because the w victims are women? I don't think so. I think it's because people aren't aware of the very serious nature, how serious it is to use rape as a form of weapon. We're, we're lagging behind. It's, it's simply not acceptable. We have to make sure that people understand that today it is not acceptable to use rape as a weapon. It's a weapon which doesn't only inflict harm on the society today, but also on coming generations. It's something, an awareness which people must reach. I think Amy said about um, uh, uh, who are, we, I, I just kind of, you know, I'm going, we call them victims and that's, that's victimizing. So let's call them the survivors. Um, but who are they? Because you mentioned that it was often powerful. It was not, it was powerful women. And one of the th we had a little discussion before we came out here, and that was about the, the, um, that we cannot victimize the survivors. Because I know what you have seen, Dennis, and what people see is an extreme strength among them. They're not just victims, they are really also strong women because they lived through many things. And, and you know, if the statistics speak true, many here in this room, both men and women, will have experienced it. And, you know, that is for, for one say, I have. Uh, and it's good that it's being more accepted to talk about. But it is strong women. And I know you've seen that too, Dennis, and we all have. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think, I, j to be clear, any, any woman could be the target of this, right? Uh, but, I, I, but I think that we have the wrong idea in a lot of people that, it, 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 that it's weak women, right? That, the, 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 that those women are somehow inviting it or allowing it, and that's who it's happening to, and that, 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 that misses so many points. I mean, um, um, first of all, just, just attributing blame to women, uh, but, but also, yeah, this, this, I, what I think it really misses is, is that there is this, th this real mechanism of control in almost all, uh, all kinds of violence against, against women. Uh, so, so yes, it, it's true that it, it makes it very, very difficult for women to stand up, to have voice. I mean, one, one of the things that I study is, 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 uh, is body language and power and, and you know, the, the relationship between expansive body language and power and contractive body language and powerlessness. Girls learn very early. Every kids learn very early. By the time they're about five, we find in our studies, they start to associate expansive body language with boy, and contractive body language with girl. So if we show them two pictures uh, of a wooden sort of artist doll, one in a contractive posture, one in an expansive posture, we have them look at sixteen pairs of these. They think the, the expansive one is a boy and the contractive one is a girl by the time they're five. They really start to enact these behaviors when they get to middle school. And because they're so associated with power and the feeling of power, and power is associated with voice and acting and speaking up and being able to be creative and, um, and, and make change in the world, we, we're limiting our daughters so early on, right? Like we, we, we're teaching them that they cannot unapologetically be proud and open and speak up. And so, uh, you know, all of these power dynamics become so complex, uh, and not in terms, not just in terms of, of who's targeted, but also the extent to which women can actually report what's happening to them, right? Without, without fear of, of um, uh, not, not just um, criticism or, di or not being believed, but, but just outright ostracism. And that, that's happening everywhere. That's happening, that's happening in, you know, in, in say, in the U.S. Um, you see the, the kinds of violence against women that you see online that you may think, you know, sticks and, stick and stones will hurt my, bone, my, my, hurt my bones, but names will never hurt me. I don't know if you will, um, will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Words do hurt women. W words hurt everyone. And so what, what we see happening, say, in... In, te in the tech industry in particular, is that women who start to really succeed get bullied very quickly 
and it escalates. I mean, it's, it's very, very vicious and aggressive. It's, it's a collective thing that happens. There might be one or two bullies leading this, but, but other people get on board very quickly with it. And you know, they're seen as a threat. They need to be expelled. Uh, and, and so they start getting, what, rape threats. Like all the time, death threats, rape threats. Their kids get rape threats. Um, they pe people send them, you know, violent, aggressive pornography. Um, you, 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 this eventually becomes so taxing, and people start to withdraw because you're the one being bullied, and people don't want to be around the target of, of of this kind of aggressive bullying because maybe they'll be the next target. Yeah. You lose your community. You're stripped of your voice. People talk about it, about this kind of bullying, as, as the worst thing they've ever been through, yeah. right? You're taking their, you're stripping their community away. So, um, yeah, I think the, these these power dynamics are are really interesting, and and the, because women are are taught very early that they shouldn't speak up, it makes it even more complicated. I was uh, lucky enough to be on the G7 Gender Advisory Council with uh, for Prime Minister Trudeau last year with. Uh, Melinda Gates and Malala and Christine Lagarde and you know some of my heroes. It was a very humbling moment. But one of the, some of the discussions that the leaders had was around violence against women, including cyber violence, because it's also a democratic problem <laughs> that you know, women who stand up and stand out will get pushed back, both physically and uh, in words and names um, and threats. Um, but if we now, if we look at what we need to do, because often it has been the state's responsibility to protect the survivor. Um, we also see civil society uh, playing a big role now. So just from, from your opinion, if I may start with you, uh, Pascal and, and, and Amy, and Amy uh, sorry, um, Rachel, what role can civil society play in this? Uh, because we have the state that, you know, is the duty bearer and the protector, uh, but but also what what role does other play, stakeholders play? If you allow me to first come back to what was said before, uh, I think it's about power in all situations of violence against women. But still, it's important to make a difference if we speak about the situation in a society, roughly in peace, in an office situation where often um, bullying, sexual harassment goes against strong persons like you described it, um, or if we talk about the war context where all the basic standards of humanity are somehow out of order. Um, it's again about power, but it's about using sexual violence as a war weapon. And I think the answers we have to formulate uh, to these different types of, of, of um, situations are different kind of answers. And I would come back to what I, uh, I said at the beginning. I think, I think in societies which are in peace, it's important also to take into account the cultural context, but there it is about law, enforcing law. It's fighting against stereotypes, and I, I do agree that it's, it's, um, it's a responsibility of parents, but not only. And, um, and don't underestimate how much we are also socialized in societies which have those structures. So we would be um, overwhelmed with the job if we should be able to change that just uh, educating our kids. That's one of our responsibilities. The other one is really that we have laws in place and we have to um, take those who um, violate those laws accountable. That is also something which is the same for all the situations. But I think in our societies, the common approach between civil society and the stakeholders, police, doctors is to try to formulate a coherent answer to the phenomenon on violence, domestic violence, and to act in complementarity. So shelter organizations working with police and uh, trying to sit at the same table. And I can tell you, in the 19s, when we started that kind of work, they didn't even speak the same language. It was not even that they didn't want it to work together. They just simply didn't understand each other. So that was already a, a, a tough work to bring them all at, to the same table so that they would understand how does a shelter organization or an advocacy organization look at the phenomenon of domestic violence, what is the discussions they have with victims, and what is the challenges a police officer has when he comes to a, a place of domestic violence and, and they say everything is fine and he, he doesn't know if it is true or not. So it's 
to understand each other and to have a common response. When we come to the war context, and I would come back to what actually was done by civil society bringing the best Security Council resolution we have because it formulates all the different layers of an answer. First of all, prevention. Prevention is about gender equality, it's about prevention of war. It's about uh, if, if the, the, the incidence of, of, of violence against women goes up, this is an indicator that a, a war a situation is escalating. So prevention is the first thing. And then protection, it's our state responsibility to protect people who live in our countries. So I think this is something, even in a war context, we have a humanitarian law which is in place and we have to enforce that. And we have to, to make sure that everyone, uh, all the combatants are respecting that war. And this, the, the third one is participation in all the peace negotiations. You will always, and it's, it's, it's simple, you can watch television and, um, and you most of the time do not have enough women involved in peace building, peace making. And if you want to have a sustainable peace, you need them on the table. I stop there. Yeah, <laughs> so I can add on to that. So um, a couple things. I think that um, government can and should play a bigger role in preventing violence, as you mentioned. Um, there needs to be more investment in prevention. Direct, ser you know, direct services and enforcement is is great. But if we can actually, ed you know, increase education and prevent violence before it starts, um, and change the cultural norms that Amy was referring to earlier, and actually provide comprehensive sex education, consent education, healthy relationship, healthy communication, all of the things that promote healthy values, not just saying no more bad things, but also promoting what is what does good relationship look like? How, how does good communication happen? You know, And that needs to be taught consistently from a very young age, and we don't provide that. And I think that needs to, um, I think the government needs to play a role in, in enforcing that and, you know, legislating that. But I also know that, you know, government is reactive, right? So um, civil society plays a role in filling that gap and creating large scale change and media is one way to do that, um, to change cultural norms, um, partnering with businesses. Businesses can play a tremendous role, corporations in um, trying to create that change. Gillette just came out with a new ad, I don't know if anyone saw it a week ago, um, promoting healthy manhood. Um, that, that is the kind of role that companies can play in transforming our cultural norms. And if I may add to that, it's really interesting on the on stereotyping. Uh, we see a big, big movement in private sector today uh, that is a, where, where a lot of the big, big companies are getting together and uh, actually telling ad companies and say, you cannot keep the objectifying of women, the stereotype, here's what a strong man is and here's what a beautiful woman is. And they are actually sitting on two thirds. It was started by Unilever, UN Women, Procter and & Gamble, and some of the really big ones sitting on almost two-thirds of the ad budgets in the world. Mm -hmm. And when they start to push, you know, because it takes a lot to change the cultural norms, and culture plays a, a, a big role. Have you any a comment to this, Carl? Well, I think uh, it's important, and I've heard everyone out, and, and everyone's made so many valid points about, you know, the legalities that need to be done and all the laws that need to be made and how you can stop... And I think that, of course, you address the media as well. And I think trial by social media, which is a new age phenomena of actually a platform of expression. And I just want to tell everybody about what happened in India recently. Uh, it's the Me Too movement that broke out six to eight months ago, uh, which had happened in Hollywood earlier. And it, how, with the help of social media, how it's impacted the fabric of Indian society. And, you know, we know that, you know, there has been tremendous abuse in our country. And just that one phenomena, the Me Too movement that began, not just in the film fraternity, but also it went everywhere. You know, it went into the corporate sector. Suddenly there were people, you know, everyone used to, you were told to have a certain kind of legalities in place in organizations, but no one was acting on them. Now there were commissions set up and there were, uh, there were summits set up and there were people who were now, you know, there for, for women to go and speak with. The Me Too movement in India just shows that what the power of the social media can be. You know, just, not just Facebook and Twitter, and just, just forms of expression where women can talk about their, you know, their situation 
or the incidents that have troubled them. And it's become, it's just gone viral in, in the strongest manner possible. And I can already see the ramifications and repercussions of that. I can see the result of that. And I just feel that, you know, just constant discussion like we're doing today and constantly speaking about it and women to constantly write about it in any form. If they can't, sometimes back home, it's tough for girls to tell their parents about what they've gone through. Just because that's the way they've been raised. That's just the way, you know, you know, the way the fabric of the society is. But some of them have went in on social media and things have changed in their life and things have changed in the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think there are perils to social media. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's without its problems, but definitely what's happening now and how social media has kind of enhance the possibilities of prevention truly opens my head and heart out. Yeah, and, and if I may just kind of say it's, it's, it's so, it, having seen what happened there and really also seeing that men who kind of said, okay, I'll try to walk in her shoes because some of the conversations that's been where a woman has told about how is it to walk the streets in the evening or I don't go for a run in the evening or I don't do this because or I don't do that you know, that has really been an eye-opener for many men as well. I think it's very important to say violence against women is not a woman's problem. It's a societal issue, whether it's as rape as a weapon of war, whether it is, you know, in the north, south, east and west. It's a societal problem. It's a societal uh, responsibility that we all need to be in, in. And also knowing that the discussion about men and women it also hurts men, and not just as, as victims or survivors, but also those stereotypes that they are put into about this is how you act uh, harms harms there as well. May I so just, may I add one one yeah. piece sure. about about it's good. Um, what what individuals can do, and you know the role of social media, which I know has there's some terrible things happening and there's some great things happening, but one thing I think we we haven't quite addressed is that individuals. We need to do better. We are not doing well. Like we have let ourselves go, you know, and uh, it's kind of disappointing. I mean, the the culture of, of harassment and bullying, especially again, in, in, in the work that I do online, is is just it's it's hideous. And what I hear people say, so I'm writing about bullying and bystanding and bravery among adults right now. Uh, and you know, most people, the vast majority of people are bystanders who are either doing nothing or becoming what I call accessory bullies. They jump on board because they'd rather be on the bandwagon with the powerful person who seems to be winning than with the target. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And I call this social bravery, which is difficult. It's hard. And you know, it's, it seems like maybe it's not to, hard to speak up online, but it really is because people fear losing their communities. So I do think that people need to step in when they see something happening. You, to change norms, what you need to, you need to do is provide evidence that the norms are changing, right? So for example, um, in the 1970s, littering was a big problem in the US. And all of these experiments were done. How do we get people to stop littering? And they found that the best way was to get rid of litter was to, to show people not littering. And then other people said, oh, I guess we don't litter anymore, right? So right now, social media is littered with this sort of net, this trash uh, that, 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 is, um, that makes people think that's normative. If people start stepping in and, and being, being um, supportive of, of targets, uh, we, we get a change. And there's a, a very recent game theory economics paper that came out showing that it takes about 25% of the relevant population online to, to, to completely turn that bandwagon around, to change the norm. So when people say, oh, there's nothing I can do to change things on social media, they are wrong. There are things, and I, I plead with you, uh, you know, this is, this is something that we all can do. Step up, be a brave heart, you know, be that person. Who do you wanna be in the end? Do you wanna be the person who did nothing? Or do you wanna say, I put myself out there and I did the right thing. And doing the right thing, Dennis, what would be doing the right thing to uh, tackle? I think that social norms are very, very important when it comes to combating sexual violence. In my experience, for example, we found that when a child is raped, the parent's reaction is to go straight to the police in less than 24 hours, 
as soon as they find out, they go to the police or they go to the hospital if the child is injured or wounded. But when it's an adult, the reaction is not the same. Even though we put out information encouraging people to come and see us within 12 hours so that they can take prevention against uh, sexually transmitted diseases and HIV AIDS, it's the social norms. Women are simply reticent. They don't want to go to the police or to the hospital. They're reticent. It, it's only once there are consequences from the rape and that they can no longer bear those that they come and see us at the hospital. But that's a social standard. Because when a woman comes to see us and tells us that she's been raped and breaks the silence, society doesn't provide her with support. In our culture, a woman will be excluded from society. A husband will reject his wife as if it were her fault that she got raped rather than his protecting her. I've been to other societies where the, a woman's body belongs to the family. And once the woman has been raped, the, they behave as if the woman's body belonged to the family and not to her. Crimes of honor, for example. So these social norms have a very strong influence on the way in which victims of uh, sexual violence react and behave when that it's happened. Silence is a social norm. It's a form of social behavior which protects the perpetrator, if the perpetrator knows that if I threaten the victim, she won't say anything, that perpetrator will go on raping not just the same woman, but other women as well. So I think it's very important to break those social norms so that uh, rape victims are, feel that they can break the silence. And it's only if they break the silence that perpetrators will be held to account. Bah, je, je, je crois que well, today, when I look at the situation today and compare it with 10 years ago, now women speak about violence. You can tell that there is a movement in almost all countries. Could be because of social networks, but there's definitely a sort of awakening, a rising awareness of sexual violence so that the perpetrator today is in a less secure situation today than he was 10 years ago when silence was virtually an absolute rule. Whereas now, as has just been said, you have to get the doctors, the, the psychologists, the lawyers, the judges, all the stakeholders, they all have to pull together. We say that today, but it wasn't obvious 10 years ago there was a time when I would write a medical report, I'd send it to the judge, and then I would be standing there in court as if I, as if I were the culprit. And you need to get the policemen, the doctors, everybody to sit down together and discuss and understand what has happened to the victim. Today, things are far better. And the trials that are going on in the Congo today they are conducted by the army, not with civilians. And I think there is some progress, and I believe that it's along that path by giving a voice to the women. That is the only way in which they are going to overcome this problem. Um, and I know you could, you, could, you could work so many other places, but can I just say, can I, I think, on behalf of all, all of us, thank you for keeping doing what you do, because it's so needed. So um, now it's your turn. I will uh, start taking some questions. Oh, there's a lot. Uh, that's good. And we have some people with uh, mics. I'm going to take three questions at a time, and then we're going to see how we, uh, we address it. So you are, uh, yep. It's, please say, you, I, I'm just going to say, just ground rules. Please say your name, where you come from. And I'd like to have a question and not a statement. 
Um, so my name is Doa. I'm from Turkey, but I go to the International School of Zuga in Luzern. And my question is for the panel. Um, how can we educate young boys about how horrible sexual harassment is in conservative nations where sex is never talked about in schools or at homes? The next one, who has the other mic? I think we're there. Hello, my name is Béranger, and my question is aimed at Mr. Mukwege, and I was wondering if I could ask it in French, if that would be easier. Sure. Donc, monsieur. I'd like to ask you, you help these women who have been raped, and you've set up a hospital for this. I think that what you're doing is simply wonderful, but sexual abuse doesn't only live, leave physical uh, consequences, also emotional ones. So how do you help these women, not just to overcome the physical, but also the mental harm? Have the mic over here, yep. Uh, so, hello, my name's Isaac Glover, originally from the UK, but living in Switzerland. And in the panel today, we've spoken a lot about changing culture and changing societal norms. And these are all things that take like a very long time is it possible to be able to fix this issue with violence against women like in a short term? Or is this something that has to happen over multiple generations? Good. I think I'll turn to uh, the panel. There were three good questions. First about education, the emotional support, but also how can we fix it and can we speed it up? Who will start? We don't know everybody, but sure, you know, I'll start. Rachel, you have uh, worked with. Yeah, I think, um, to uh, teach young boys um, and uh, in countries where maybe we're not talking about sex at all. Um, I think you have to empower uh, male role models. So men in that society that, so for example, like coaches using sports, um, teachers, people that are in positions of power to be role models for young boys and men. And I think, I think you, I mean, I think obviously it would be great if we could have a conversation about sex and consent in every country, but that's not the only thing we need to talk about. I mean, healthy relationships, there are ways to talk about how you interact between two people in a healthy way um, that isn't gonna be talking about sex, like how you ask for something, how do you treat someone um, when you're you know, asking for tea, right? That's the, have you seen the T consent um, video? I mean, there are ways that we can talk about how to communicate with each other, how to have empathy um, without necessarily talking about sex. And I think it, um, if we can get more men um, to be role models for young boys, I think we can create a lot of change. Can I turn to you on this? Because it's also a cultural thing. I, I do think that, you know, um, uh, cinema can play a large part, and I think the expression of that, and I think there are so many countries, you know, where the, which have very conservative societies but have very progressive cinemas, uh, and I think that those films need to just reach out to many people. There are documentaries, there are films, uh, there are special features that are made that address this issue, and I think just making sure that they reach out to those millions of people in those countries, I think really, really does impact. I think um, sometimes the way you tell a story and sometimes a fictional narrative can really address a fact in the most emotional, connective manner. And I think in those countries, if they can use that as a tool to communicate to millions of people about how to prevent abuse, that would be a start. Amy, are you, can I put you on the spot on the, on the quick fix? Uh, yeah, I, so I, I, um, I, I do, I do, I disagree. I think that norms can change really, really quickly, and in fact, I think they do. So what I was talking about with that twenty-five percent rule—that's where the tipping point is, and all of a sudden, it changes so quickly, you can't believe that it was ever a different way. And so I want to give you one example, um, and, and, and you know, it's 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 different a bit, but but I, th I think there are some similarities. Um, smoking in the United States. I mean, you know, I'm in my forties. And, uh, and when I was growing up, uh, lots and lots of people smoked everywhere. Now I find it in, in the U.S. like shocking when I see someone smoking a cigarette. It, it changed so quickly that it's hard to even remember that it was the same way in my, you know, my lifetime. So I do think that norms can change very quickly. And that's why I, I, I implore you, like you, the, you young people who are so much more optimistic, and engaged, and I'm so inspired by you, I know that you all are gonna make this change. 
I, I really, I, I'm not just, I'm not saying that it's not wishful thinking. I deeply believe that. And I think it's going to happen so fast that in 10 years, you, you won't believe how different it is. Like, it will be hard to remember how it once was. Now, I'm not saying that that's true for all kinds of violence against women. I'm talking about, you know, th th like some are going to be a little bit easier to change than others, but I think that this is going to shift quickly. We've seen it, and two, just, and I'm not comparing wearing a seat belt with sexual violence, I, but, uh, but we have it on seat belts and wearing helmets. Yeah. And it was a combination of legislation, peer pressure, and statistics that showed the effect. Can I say something from the foreign policy perspective? What we what we can do as a as a government? I mean, first of all, is empowering civil society organisations in countries in, in in our partner countries, and then on the on the political level, I think I mean, in no social and cultural context, um, violence is not destroying social fabric of a society and does not have, as you said at the beginning. Um, very high economic costs. So I think it needs a respectful dialogue with all our partners, but also then to make the point how much it's harming the society and how much um, you can prevent that from happening as a partner government when you act. And I think as long as you have a respectful dialogue, you can be powerful with that. And it needs that combination of, of all the actors, of the civil society actors, of cultural actors um, and arts but also of governments who speak out. And, and Dr. Dennis, there was a, a question around the emotional uh, care. Uh, tra Treating a victim of sexual violence is about the most delicate type of treatment and care that uh, a doctor or a nurse would ever have to face up to. It's not an accident, it's not a natural disease, it's not a pathology, it's an intentional act which has been inflicted on the victim by another person whereas people should be entitled to be protected by the other person. So the other person, instead of showing empathy, is inflicting violence on you. This violence, this physical violence, will have a very, very profound psychological impact. And that is why managing these cases at the Pansy Hospital, we, in this management of these cases, we really have to focus on the individual, on the person. There is no uh, one-size-fits-all treatment for victims of sexual violence, at least not treating the emotional aspect of their injury. You have to listen to the victim. You have to really be very receptive to the expectations this person has of the medical staff. So we take a very holistic approach. The victim has to tell us what her needs are, what her requires, what she expects of us. And we are there to respond to that and accompany the healing process. The physical aspect is the easiest to take care of. We can repair the, the body, but when it comes to repairing psychological damage, the psychological and emotional scars, that healing is a far longer process and the depth of the trauma will also depend on the way in which the person in question has responded. So it's a very difficult healing process. Certainly a victim of sexual violence cannot be considered as a medical case. Uh, you can't, you have to see, as I say, it in a holistic fashion. You have to look at it in an overall manner. One thing is important, you must avoid having the victim repeat 10 times all the trauma that she has undergone. That must be avoided at all costs. So we have a sort of one-stop uh, shop system where the victim can tell the story once and then she is taken care of. And then we hope to be able fully and totally to deal with the physical and the emotional injuries. The time for a quick three more questions. 
Hi, Gary Cohen. I work in the private sector. I'm also the founder of Together for Girls, which is operating in 24 countries too. I, would st I always tell people I am standing up. Right. Actually, I'm not standing up. I have all this stuff on my lap. Oh, sorry. Okay, Gary. there we go. <laughs> now I'm standing, in case you didn't notice. In any case, um, cigarette use, the dramatic reduction was catalyzed by changes in laws and policies in use of cigarettes in public spaces. So people were forced not to smoke in their place of work and so forth. Seatbelts were catalyzed by laws requiring their use. The change in social norms came later. So here's my question. Is it really feasible to expect this type of change that we really need to have happen without catalytic actions to substantially raise the consequences for perpetrators? What's happening now in the workplace is because people are losing their jobs and companies are losing their reputations and we are going to see a substantial change in the workplace. And working now nine years on this in 24 countries trying to stop sexual violence against girls and being a man, I feel if the consequences don't get ratcheted way up, we're going to change mindset by changing behavior as opposed to expecting cha mindset to change the behavior, if that made any sense. Hello, uh, my name is Fadel Diadine. I'm originally from Albania but currently living in Switzerland. Um, you talked about venting or talking on social media about rape or sexual harassment. But there have been several cases where women have accused people of rape or sexual harassment without proof, but the public didn't care. Because, uh, I mean, everybody loves uh, a ni uh, some nice news. And, um, yeah, the careers of these people, of these accused people, were destroyed. And according to study uh, conducted by the Northeast University in Boston, approximately 10% of rape accusations are false. What is your opinion about that, and uh, how can you prevent such things from happening? Um, violence is often connected to religion. I'm thinking of forced marriage or um, female circumcision. How do we address it if it is justified by religion, which in the end might actually mean addressing it means questioning their or a religion? Thank you. So we have very few minutes, so um, a comment from the panel to one of the questions. I'm not sure we can we can uh, we can get to all sure. of it. But um, I'll I'll take Rachel. the second one uh, <laughs> head on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, sexual assault, um, like uh, every other crime, has a very small percentage between, and it's there are lots of different studies out there. Um, that show it's between two and nine percent, um, and this is every single crime. There is a small number of uh, misreports, or um, and yet the focus, I think, on sexual assault and and misreporting, I think, is evidence um, of the fact that um, women are discredited and these social norms that continue to discredit women of these stereotypes that we have around women um, being liars or being emotional or um, I think really play into that. I also, I, I would reject the notion that I think a few, you know, the men that have been um, burned at the stake and had their lives ruined, I think um, some men have, uh, if someone had shared a story on social media, their lives aren't ruined. Louis C.K. is back um, doing stand-up comedy, um, his life wasn't ruined. And what about all of the women? What about their lives, their, their careers, their, all of the missed opportunities they had? Why, are, why, you know, why is that one man more important than all of those other women in their future? Amy, I can see you can almost not hold it back. <laughs> I don't want to. I mean, you you said that so succinctly. I, I don't feel like I need to say a whole lot more about that. But I mean, you know, I, I'm 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 a, I teach at at Harvard, and and I I'm you know aware of of the you know um, um, the the rates of of sexual assault and false reporting there, and it's remarkably low. And I just want to point out, it is so hard to report a rape. Yeah. The, the, it, is so so painfully excruciatingly excruciatingly hard. You will be ostracized by some people, and so the the, the idea that this is this is a, like really a problem is I, I think uh, uh, kind of alarming to me. Um, 
again and again, the, 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 these women are missing so many opportunities. Their careers are cut short because of the things that happen. No one's, and you know, this concept of the marketplace of ideas, that we need lots of people out there in order to have like a, a good marketplace of, of creative ideas. When, when, when women are taken out of the running as say graduate students because they've been sexual assault, sexually assaulted, you, you're now, not only are they losing out, but we're all losing out. We never get to hear what would have happened if they had continued on their trajectory. So false reporting is incredibly low. It's excruciatingly painful. You will be ostracized no matter what. And I think we need to focus on what happens to the women who, who, whose careers and lives are cut short. Thank you. And uh, now I'm going to change pace a little bit. Um, sorry, time's running. Uh, you will get one minute to respond to something in a minute. Um, so you will all have one minute or 30 seconds to uh, respond to where do we go from here? How do we move the needle forward on gender-based violence? but I have one requirement, and that is that you do it as a tweet. That's about 140 characters, 160 yeah. characters. 280. So it's 280 now, it's we, 200. we've gone a little higher, but it's a short, to the point, comment on what do we do. Well, I'm just gonna start by what I said right at the top. I think we start the process at home. We change the way we parent our children. We actually focus on what we say, was what is right and wrong about gender biases. And we just change the atmosphere about how we raise our daughters and sons at home. That's what I would say. And I think that was less than 280. Thank you. Hashtag WEF19. Yes. Right. We'll go next. Let's well, go. The, the best quote I ever heard was once at the, at the um, 25th of November on the International Day Against Violence Against Women, and it was the then uh, Amnesty International um, boss, Irene Khan from Bangladesh. Uh, we were having a playback theater, and she said, it's in our hands. And I think that's really, it means we have the power to change that. It's in our hands. Hashtag do it now. So I was, uh, I think my tweet was, uh, I have a couple, I have like 10 tweets I wanna give to everyone. So um, the future is fiction, you will help write it, help write a, a future where violence and harassment is unacceptable. But to go to Gary's question earlier really quickly, um, I think it really, we have to hold ourselves accountable, and Amy was talking about this earlier, and we can start small, and it starts with the language you use every day, hold each other accountable, don't reinforce gender norms, um, things like she throws like a girl, or men can't cry, stop being a, you know, expletive word. Um, you, that matters, that stuff all matters. It used to be socially acceptable to say that's gay, it's not anymore. It, it really is starts with that that small, and I think we all can hold each other accountable. Thank you, Rachel. Moi, je dirais tout simplement. I would simply say that together, we can draw a red line against the use of uh, rape as a weapon of war. A red line. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I would say, um, and I'm sorry, I had to quickly write it out. Uh, yeah, take personal responsibility, even when it's awkward and socially risky. Think about the long game, about your legacy. Who, who are you? <laughs> what, what do you want to look back on and, 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 and see yourself? What, what role do you want to have played? Um, be socially brave. Your actions don't just help that particular target. They tell everyone else that, that they can be socially brave. They change the norms. Thank you. I got one. It's, uh Violence against women is everybody's business. Mm. Pull, notch, stand up, speak up, now. Hashtag WF19, hashtag the power voice. So um, thanks a lot to a wonderful panel. I hope you had had as great an experience as, as I have. And, and, and let us, us make sure that, that the conversation does not stop here. Because 
It's not just the start, but we really got to ramp it up. If we got to look back in a couple of years to see what this defining moment has meant for the world, we have to see progress. We really have to see progress. And I hope that you will carry the message out here from tonight. I'll just give you 10 seconds to think about what are you going to do when you walk out, what are you going to do tomorrow, and what are you going to do the day after. I'm sure that with full commitment from this room and from everybody tuning in and from people up in the, in the, the Congress Center, we will be able to reach that new normal. But all change starts with ourselves. We can't wait till somebody will fix it for us. We have to push ourselves to be the best we can. We have to push the system to change and, you know, kind of go for the perpetrators and also change that narrative, then we can achieve this beautiful vision.